continue in the matter of Shamzan and 44-49 Lowndes Square Management Company Limited. Yes, Mr. Mitchell. My Lord. Um, I should say that my lay client got trapped in the security queues and will be attending, so I apologise in advance for any disturbance when she arrives. Well, there'll be no disturbance, that's fine. But my Lords, um, you will have had from us the core bundle, the supplemental bundle, the skeleton arguments, two from me uh, and one from Mr Duckworth. Yes, um, I discovered when discussing with my... Um, Lords this morning that I haven't seen, I don't think I'd be so bold to say I haven't received, but um, the your supplemental skeleton, uh, though I've been told what it says, <laughs> um, but uh, if you had a spare copy, I'd be grateful. It it's is, probably, it probably is on my system somewhere. And I just it should be in the core it. bundle. Uh, oh, it's the core bundle. The core bundle. It should be behind tab 10. So it is. Well, there you are. Thank you very much indeed. But I hope I'll be able to now, make that it. Now, that made it a bit hollow when I said, we've read the papers very carefully, Mr. Mitchell. <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. Take it quick. I guess they're all the same, because um, we have read them uh, uh, pretty carefully, even though I think we missed that. Yeah. Yes, my lord. Um, well, so, my lord, the, the headline points here, I mean, what the issues raised are obviously the duty of care question, in particular, the relationship between the law of agency um, and whether there is this approximate relationship. That's one point. And the other point is the privy point. Um, is it the case that the terms of the uh, promises made by my client's own landlord to the defendant are something which effectively should be enforced against her? I mean, this is, this is what it's yes. about. I think I'm not giving too much away if I say we're more interested in the first point than the second. You will have to deal with the second, but that seems the real focus of the argument to be the first. Yes. Well, my lord, um, I'm glad to hear it. Of course, I would remind you that the learned judge founded his decision uh, on that second proposition. Um, maybe. We could read his judgment various ways, but the, we want to get the law right at this level. Well, someone look, let me focus. And, and there is a respondent's notice, so I don't really think, apart from a debating point, which you're perfectly entitled to make, focusing on exactly how the judge reasoned it isn't, shouldn't be the heart of your submissions. Uh, no, my lord, I'm going to focus more on the substance of uh, the, the, the position here. So, um, my first headline point is that in this case, my client is not contending for a novel duty of care. I mean, we are not in the situation here, um, which my Lord had in Benyatov, where you've got a, a brand new uh, potential duty. Um, what we say is that the law already recognises uh, the possibility that a duty of care can arise where a person um, assumes responsibility in relation to property and then negligently fails to take care to do the things he assumed responsibility to do. Now, I appreciate that my light use of the words assume responsibility uh, could produce some controversy with my learned friend. Um, but uh, the simple point here uh, is that the defendant... Was it the phrase you used to arise where someone assumes responsibility for a property? Or did you say, what, what phrase did you use? Perhaps you can't remember yourself. Uh, well, let me put it uh, precisely. Assumes responsibility to provide services in relation to a property. Now, that covers, for example, uh, the Stainsby and Troman position. It's one way of characterising what uh, Mr. Troman said he would do. Um, and as I shall develop, um, the, the point we make is that the defendant did actually cause services to be provided to, among others, my client. And that's the assumption of responsibility. Um, now, the judge's uh, point about proximity uh, is another one which I'll need to, to deal with. Um, and again, what we say is that the proximity arises 
as a result of um, the fact that the defendant is providing these services to my client. And it is very important to understand what use we make uh, of the various lease documentation, uh, which is before the court. Now, um, we are not saying, we're not relying on these leases qua party to the leases, obviously, because we're not parties uh, to any of the relevant ones. We're not suing on these documents. We're pointing to them as evidence in support of our propositions that first, the defendant had a particular skill, that is to say, it was going to supply services to this to the tenants of the property. We point to them to show how it is that the defendant ended up in a relationship with the claimant. These are building blocks in support of my submission. They are proximate to each other. These are questions of fact. But then also, because of the way that the defendant has, has said it will behave, we say uh, that these um, uh, aspects of the defendant's anticipated behaviour uh, can be used to understand the incidence uh, of the duty of uh, care which it owes. Yes, I'm not pressing you, Mr Mitchell, on any of these various things you're saying. I assume these are by way of introductory remarks. They are. Right. And, um, Some of them might required to be examined a bit further, but... Uh, um, absolutely right. Um, um, okay. I'm trying to sort of give you a tour d'horizon of where I'm going, and then I'll dive in a bit more. Um, and, and our final headline point on these portals is that we say the defendant appointed Fairbrother to be its agent to supply these particular services. Uh, it insisted that Fairbrother was not permitted uh, to delegate its obligations. The defendant wanted to maintain control. And even though Fairbrother was permitted to undertake its obligations by way of retaining independent contractors, that doesn't alter the fact that the person actually providing the services is the defendant. Um, and finally, I should of course observe that this is not my application for summary judgment on the basis that there is undoubtedly a duty of care. And my application, I was resisting the application that says that there is none. So I need to show that there is a real argument that there is a duty of care. So, my lords, um, you will have seen uh, the um, uh, concurrent lease and the original concurrent lease, but I will remind you uh, of bits of it which I say are important to establish these factual propositions. So, we have the um, so the concurrent lease uh, is at tab 9 of the supplemental bundle. So what we really need is the original concurrent lease, tab 11, because its terms are incorporated into the concurrent lease. In tab 11. Uh, no, I don't. I mean tab 10. I'm sorry. Now, the structure of the concurrent lease is, uh, in clause 1, we have the definitions. In clause 2, we have the demise. Um, I have made. Uh, no, I haven't. Oh, 
which I've made in there. And the obligation that I draw your attention to here, so it's in clause uh, two uh, of page 149. The lessee covenants with the lessor. So this is the defendant covenanting with what was then the, the lessor, Sun Life. And there's a series of covenants. On page 152, we have subparagraph J. That it will at all times during the term, perform and fulfill all the obligations of the lessor under the flat leases. So we need to discover what the obligations of the lessor under the flat leases are, because that will permit us to see how the defendant has agreed with somebody else that it will comport itself, how it will behave. So the, the flat leases, um, these also take the form of two separate documents. So there's the, the current one, which is the flat lease of 1999, which you'll find behind tab 12. And by that lease, there is a surrender of the previous flat lease, as you can see on page 144. However, uh, on page uh, 188, clause three uh, of this new flat lease is that the parties covenant with each other I'd say it vary by this lease, all the terms and conditions uh, implied into the existing lease uh, and deeds specified in the full schedule to this lease shall continue to be in full force and effect. And so we must turn to the flat lease from 1984, which you will find behind tab 13. By this lease, um, the uh, lessor uh, and the defendant. The lease flat nine, which is my client's former residence, uh, to a company called Sun Life Nominees Limited. And in the fullness of time, by a process of assignments, we get into a position where uh, the actual uh, tenant under this lease uh, is my client's immediate landlord under her short, short hold tenancy. And this lease is referred to in her yes, I mean, AST. We, 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 we know of two people in the chain. There may have been more. What company called Walbrook, isn't there, at some point, and it ends up with Sonora. Yeah. There may have been others, but we don't, we don't need to bother with that. Yes, it okay. doesn't matter at all. Um, so... Uh, here are the obligations then which Sonora, the then tenant under this lease, uh, accepted towards the defendant. So we have um, in clause one definitions, uh, clause two is the demise. Uh, clause three, starting on page 200, are Sonora's uh, covenants obviously I won't read them all out um, but they are covenants in relation to the usual things rent alterations blocking corridors not putting heavy weights um, surrendering and yielding up and, so on. and yep. so on and at clause 5 uh, on uh, page 205, we have some further covenants from Sonora, uh, and these concern repair, repainting, access for workmen, paying service charge, how to use the flat, not storing dangerous materials, 
But again, we don't need to read all this, do we? We do not. Okay. What we do need to appreciate um, is the scope of the covenant made by Sonora. So we get to number six, which is the last um, of the packages of covenants made by Sonora. The lessee hereby covenants with the lessor and with the company that follows. And then there's the final ones, which are not to assign and not to underlet. The point you're making, I haven't quite understood. The point I'm going to this make... This is the least bit surprising, so... It is not. And then if we go and turn to the assured short hook tenancy, which we'll find behind uh, tab 15... Um, and we turn to page 250. We have here um, clause 10 of that AST, whereby my client uh, promised to perform and observe Sonora's covenants, which we have just been looking at, yeah. 4, 5, and 6. Now, um, we need to look, go back to look at the third schedule, which shows um, what the defendant undertook under this flat lease to do for a tenant. So if we go to the third schedule, which you'll find on page 228, Uh, and then we start at paragraph 5-1 on page 229. Now, these are things which um, the, land, the lessor, uh, lessor's expenses and outgoings, which are reclaimable. Um, and so here we have <coughs> reclaimable is the cost of employing a caretaker or a caretaker. Clause 8, or paragraph 8 of that schedule on page 230. Uh, the proper fees of the lessor for the general management of the building. Uh, 17, the cost of doing all acts, matters and things as shall be necessary or advisable. Uh, and then clause, paragraph 18 is actually replaced by the um, concurrent lease that's amended. But it also um, permits the recovery of expenditure incurred by the landlord in respect of or incidental to the performance and exercise by the lessor of the obligations and powers imposed or conferred under the provisions of this lease or the concurrent lease. Where is the provision which introduces Schedule 3? Um, it is. Because, as you say, this is just a list of landlord's costs. Surprise for the person who gets there first. Yes, exactly. Well, there's a reference to Schedule 3 on page 198 in the definition of total expense. Mm -hmm. A service charge. It's a Dutchworth right? rising to claim the prize. Uh -huh. no, well, it, it, um, my Lord Lord Nugent has it right. Schedule 3 is a creature of the service charge provisions, which is why it appears here. It's, it's not yes. something that the but, but Where are the service charge provisions? Uh, well, you, you're, you're looking at them. Am I? Well, there's the definition of service charge. Yes, but there must be an obligation to pay the service charge somewhere. Yes, there Where's is. Where's that? Uh, yeah. um, you haven't done it yet, Mr. No, I don't think I have. <laughs> it's too 
Right. It'll be in, obviously in the lessee's covenant somewhere, but I, um, I think it's four five. Yeah. Well, we have three council, <laughs> four solicitors. Solicitors win, I think. Yes, it's uh, to the price of my lord. It's two oh seven is where the covenant to uh, pay the service charge is. Yes, two oh seven. Thank you. Yes, well, you were, you were trawling us through the, uh, the well, what you were actually presenting it as the uh, lessors or the defendants' obligations, but in fact, all you've done so far is take us to another aspect of the lessee's obligations, namely to pay for any costs of employing any porter. So if we go back to the original concurrent lease, yes. um, and uh, to... Uh, clause 2 uh, J and clause 2 U so you'll need to go clause 2 J is page 152 yes so all the obligations for less or under the flat leases and then if you go to clause U on page 152 well, you take us to 2 J already J would have been to already you were going to now yeah. What the defendant covenanted with the head landlord to do is at all times to employ Messrs. Fairbrother um, uh, to act as managing agents for the building and in relation to the provision of the services and the carrying out of the other matters referred to in the third schedule to the flat leases. So there are clearly services being provided here and they are being provided by Fairbrother. Um, and they're being provided by Fairbrother uh, because the uh, defendant is obliged to provide them uh, to the uh, tenants. So uh, and there's a false... Where does that come from? Sorry. Well, if we go to... Uh, there's a false assumption there. Yeah, let's go to the flat lease uh, at clause 5-6. So, flat lease 1984 behind tab 13. Yes. Uh, as page 207. Yeah, you take this out already. And now it's an obligation to pay. An obligation to pay, but listen, it's a um, to pay for the lessor without any deduction of the service charge. Um, in respect of all the costs, expenses, payments, and liabilities incurred by the lessor in connection with the state and condition of the building and the provision of services to the tenants thereof. Yes, but that, that isn't enough. I'm saying that with, with enormous emphasis, yeah. but we're asking a pretty simple question. Where is the obligation to provide the services to the tenants? Um, well, if the landlord has an obligation... Um, if the landlord is providing services to the tenants, um, and if the... Yes, if the landlord chooses to provide those services as far as they're within the scope of things which he may choose to provide, they have to pay for them. Yeah. We've got that. Yeah. But the starting point is to see where the, what, ob what services the landlord is required to provide uh, and or... Uh, any services which are expressly said he has discretion whether to provide. Well, my lord, is, is, is that right? Because the, um, I ask rhetorically, because the thing is that if the defendant is providing the services by using his agent fair brother to do so, then it is providing the services. Ah, and that well, is, no, the, that, is that's at another point. stage of the argument. Mm. Um, if your position is that there wasn't an obligation to provide the services, but they nevertheless were, and they were of a kind for which they were entitled to charge, fine, I've got that. Mm -hmm. I, I may say so, that'd be rude. I had that some time ago, when I did the pre-reading. Oh, my Lord, but I, I, I uh, But yeah. if, you're not, if, you're, if it is no part of your case there was any obligation to provide these services, then that would be useful to know. 
I know because there are some provisions about the provision of porterage, which you taken us towards every other provision in these, but we haven't taken us there yet. I can't remember where they are, but I've noted them down somewhere. Well, there's clause 2U of the original concurrent lease, which is the one we were looking at before. Um, and the provision of services um, for the quarters, I think I just took you uh, through those um, with the service charge provisions, because if they're providing the services, they're entitled to provide them, and therefore they're entitled to claim money back for them. But my point is, see, they did provide them. Well, I think I had in mind... Um, uh, Clause seven. I had in mind clause seven uh, F. No, sorry, clause I. seven I at page two one five two one six. That's what I've marked up. And a time, my lord. Uh, sorry. And a time, my lord. Yeah, uh, yes, I was going to come to that as well. And indeed, eight 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 C. Although that's on a different point. Yeah, but that's where that's the where the question the questions relating to provision of portary services are most explicitly addressed, and I assumed you were going to focus on those, but maybe you're not. Well, as I say, my lord, I mean, my focus is, is not so much on what are the obligations of this defendant to somebody who, who um, like, who isn't me. What I'm saying is, as a matter of fact, uh, the defendant but was... But that is why we bothered services. with the contract at all. And this is, this, my point is that the contract is something which I use as evidence, which helps me to make Yeah, but you've got to look at all the bits of it, not just some. Um, well, what I need to do um, is to plead something that says the defendant is in a relationship with the claimant, and what it did was as follows. And what I've done, and what we have done, is said, you can see what the defendant actually did. These are the obligations yeah. it had. And it's a building block. Because these are the obligations it had, but that's just what you haven't been showing us. I probably just expressed myself a little bit too elliptically there. You can see what it did. Yes. It provided services to okay. the building. As a result of providing the services to me, the tenant, it owed me a duty of care. This is my point. I don't uh, think it matters I, well, I, at all. Sorry. Yeah. I do understand that's your yes. case. I agree that has to be your case. Yes. But uh, we, you were taking us very elaborately through these leases. But if it's your case, doesn't really matter what the obligations are, the fact is they did, then I'm not sure why we're going in such, such detail through the contract. Actually, I think you probably have to, because of points which Mr Duckworth makes. But... Um, we can't just be taken through them and not taken to the bits that actually deal with the provision of portary services. My lord, very well. Um, I mean, my focus in going through well, that contract is on is on. You can leave it to Mr. Duckworth if you like. I was just expecting that we would see something in this opening. As I say, my lord, my focus is very much on what happened on the ground, um, which I evidence in part by reference to what yeah. it is that the defendant did yeah. uh, and the money that it collected back again. Um, I'm not. Uh, she is not a party to this. Agreement. I mean, no, this is quite. a vital part of my case because that's why the judge, one of the reasons that the learned judge below um, decided uh, not to recognize uh, a duty of care at all. Um, but yes, I mean, the, the fact that the lease provides, that the flat lease provides a discretion um, is neither here nor there because I am not alleging a positive, uh, the breach by omission of a positive duty I contend for. We're not in that territory at all. I'm saying, as a matter of fact, this is what happened. That created the relationship, you know, that gives rise to a duty of care. Um, and uh, the actions of the porters, who I say um, were uh, the agents, sub-agents, as the case may be, of the defendant, um, amounted to a breach of that duty of care. I mean, my case is very simple. Yes. Um, maybe that that is its its merit, and the uh, so the the precise provisions of the lease uh, tell us exactly what the defendant was obliged or not obliged to do. Don't really matter so much as what it did do. 
and the explanation yes, for why. Okay. I'm sorry, I, 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 I misunderstood. You, you spent such a long time on the leases that I thought you were trying to give us a comprehensive analysis. No. But if your only point is that uh, they did provide services, which you don't actually get from the lease, but uh, you infer they were expected to, and they in fact did, and they were entitled to charge for them, um, uh, using Fair Brothers, effectively, well, um, uh, fine. Good. And of course, I do need to make some small um, uh, trot into the leases because of the judge's finding that Clause 8 um, is relevant. So I need to show that what the, um, that the relationship that my client has with this lease is that by Clause 10 of her AST, she agreed to um, follow the covenants um, which her landlord gave to the defendant. Oh, I taken... include the covenant to pay the service charge. Does she? Does no, she she's pay? excluded from that. Actually, the, the service charge. Um, it's uh, she's got the perform and serve the tenants' covenants in the superior lease, other than the covenant to pay rent. Which has service is, is the service charge reserved as rent? Is it included in that carve out, or is did she have to pay service charges while she was there, or does it not matter? Again, I don't think it, it doesn't matter because the, the point here is what the use that was made um, of the lease was to say that clause eight, which I say oh, my client did not agree to at all, um, was something that's relevant to deciding whether a duty of care should be recognized or not. And I want to say that um, clause eight being an agreement between persons who have nothing to do with me, legally speaking, because it's not my contract, I'm not a party to it, that Clause 8 just is not relevant. I'm sorry, just being being a pedant, um, my lord having raised the point, yes. what is the answer? Is service charge reserved as rent? Um, my lord, to be honest, I don't know that immediately, so we'll have to look at Well, uh, somebody can tell us yes. later. Um, yes. Can we, can I? My Lord's territory rather than mine, but I do dimly recall that that is often the case that it is and sometimes it isn't. Um, but but your point is, your, your real answer is it doesn't matter. It is. Yeah. It does. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't wish to sound glib. I, what I am trying to focus on is the, the facts which I say arguably that there was a duty of care. So I've put the, the defendant and the Claimant into a close relationship. Now, yes, I see. Well, way. fine. Uh, as you can tell from my questions, it's helpful sometimes to have flags to see which way you're going when you're taking through a lot of documents. But I, I, you're basically saying these lease provisions show uh, part of the background, which show why there is a relationship in a factual sense between um, the uh, defendant as the person responsible for seeing that these these services are provided and uh, someone occupying a flat from the uh, by, by a subtenancy from the lease yes yes okay yeah well, I mean they, they're not statutes uh, and they're not contracts to which my client is a part no I've got, I've got that point. so then the question arises in the duty of care context, we get to the first and big question. Is it the case that it would be unjust to recognise a duty of care because somehow that would cut across the, um, the structure of contracts, the, the, the sort of network of contracts? Uh, and this is where it will be helpful uh, to take up uh, the authorities of Babel. Uh, just, just before we go there, yeah. uh, just to make sure, you, you, you've addressed us on the basis, which I now understand, it's a very simple basis, that 
the leases are contracts to which your client's not a party, so they don't affect your client's position. But the leases show that the defendant was providing, was, was able to provide services to your client, and as a matter of fact, did provide services to your client. One of the points that I understand is taken against you is that as we saw to you, the defendant agreed with the freeholder that it would employ somebody else, Fairbrook, to provide the services. And I think it said, the Duckworth will, I think the Duke will tell us, that that means that it wasn't the defendant providing the services, it was Fairbrother, or Fairbrother's contractor providing the services. So at some point, are you going to address us on why you say it was the defendant who was providing the portrait? Because I think what's said against you is it wasn't them providing the portrait at all. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't expect you to do it now, because you're going to show us something else. But, but is that a point you're going to come back to, or is it...? Uh, yes, I, let, let, we can do this now. Addressing um, what is the point here? Well, do, do it subsequently if it's if it's if it's more convenient, um, or maybe in in reply if, if that's where it naturally falls. But at, at some point, I think it's a point we have to, to grapple with since it's been raised by the respondent. Fine. All right. Let's go then where I was going to go uh, to um, Henderson and Merritt to understand. Um, why it is that uh, the complex contract or structure series of cases is not relevant here. So uh, the authority itself is at tab seven. Uh, I don't know how many bundles that those authorities eventually filled up. We have them electronically. So you've got two, well, I've got two bundles, and perhaps one to nine in volume one, and the other's in volume two. Okay, it'll be in volume one. It, if I may say so, it wasn't very thoughtfully put together. I can't, I mean, there may be a rule somewhere saying um, you can't quote extracts from authorities, but common sense would tell you that that rule could be broken in the case of the Beast IB thing. You've got about 200 pages of the yeah. Beast IB split between two bundles. Um, every time I pick the bundle up, it hurts my hands. So, could someone... I'm afraid I took it out and left it on my desk <laughs> so I could lift the bundle. Yeah, my Lord, I am... Um, well, not, this is, actually, this isn't just a tweak point. You've got, we've got solicitors and counsel here. Um, I do think a bit of thought needs to go into authorities' bundles and what's what's sensible. I know there are some quite prescriptive rules, most of which you followed, though not all of them. Um, but really, it should have been obvious to anyone thinking that it's nothing but a, an obstruction to have. I think I underestimated it. It's about 400 pages of a judgment, which, um, as far as I've been able to identify, one passage is sidelined. Yeah. Um, so... Anyway, enough said. Where, do, where are you taking us to? Um, I would like to take you um, to um, the internal uh, page 170 of the report. And then the last is... Parkless Justice Aikenhead's judgment in Galliford Dry. Yeah? No. Um, oh. It, sorry. We're in Henderson and Merritt. Um, well, and that's page. So I'm talking about page 130 of the bundle. Well, I thought you said 170. Yes, sorry. In the internal page of the law report is 170. Yeah. Oh, I see. But so we didn't know which case you were taking us to, so it wasn't. Anyway, okay. uh, now I have it. I have it. Yeah. 
Yes, this is from a Lord, well Lord Goss' well -known uh, speech, yes. Well, so this is Lord Goss' um, description first um, of the how it is uh, that the names um, had relationships with the managing agents. Um, and uh, he explains um, that in the first instance, um, you had uh, uh, agents who were direct, uh, in a direct relationship uh, with the names. Yes. So we know this. And then there's also uh, the situation where names can have an indirect yeah. relationship with the agency. Now, in this case, uh, the names were complaining um, about the relationship, about things done by the sub-agents as well as by yeah. the direct agents. So all so far so familiar. Uh, if we move forward um, uh, to uh, page 137 of the bundle, internal reference 177. Yes. The argument made by the managing agents was um, that to recognise the existence of a duty uh, would be inconsistent with the contractual relationship with the parties. So that this is what Mr Duckworth uh, is saying against me here, that it's inconsistent with this contractual relationship. Um, and the argument is then, um, uh, it sets out the argument between uh, 177E and over page 177. Uh, 8A or 137 to 138, as the case uh, may be. Yes. But having set out the, the conclusion reached, if we go to what, um, uh, we've got internal reference 194, which is page 154 of your bundle. Yeah. Logoff concluded um, that there was no material distinction he could draw between uh, the, the claims of names with direct and indirect agency agreements because there had to be an implied duty to exercise uh, skill and care. That falls so one of the most important parts of this case. Um, and then over the page, um, 155. There's no material difference between the relevant contractual duty and any duty owed by the managing agents to the relevant names in the tort. It's submitted on behalf of the managing agents that the indirect names and the managing agents as parties to the chain of contracts contained in the relevant agency and sub-agency agreement must be taken to have structured their relationship so as to exclude any duty of care owed directly by the managing agents to the indirect names. And so the argument was um, that because the managing agents had, with the consent of the indirect names, assumed responsibility in respect to the relevant activities of another party um, under a sub-agency agreement, it would be inconsistent to hold that they've also assumed responsibility in respect to the same activities to the indirect names. Yes. Of course, famously, uh, the Lord Groff found that that um, didn't necessarily uh, follow. Um, and the uh, at the end of uh, that page, um, he said, uh, it's a little G, which to add, I strongly suspect that the situation which arises in the present yeah. case is most unusual. So where there's a contractual chain, it may well be inconsistent with an assumption. Well, this is a very well-known passage. Do you want, well how much, we'll just quickly remind us, how much was, do you want to read? Um, just over to, um, a 196 yes. uh, D. Well, speaking for myself, I'm pretty sure my lords as well. We know the passage, we, we have read it, yes. um, despite the sidelines, although it's the most important part of your um, uh, submissions. I think we need to read it again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the point here is that my client is not seeking um, uh, to sue. Um, a sub-agent of her own agent at all. My client is saying somebody behaved in a way which I say brought into being a duty of care and breached that duty and I want to sue them. Um, in so doing, my client is 
not setting to one side any former contractual obligations. She's not having to contradict herself. What is effectively being contended for um, by the defendants is that because in this world of real property, there is a complicated system put in place by those who own buildings um, and then let them out to companies who then let them out to eventually to individuals. Because of all that complexity, it's simply wrong that if on the facts um, a defendant does actions which cause harm to a claimant, that it, it's not fair to recognise a duty of care because of this very complicated set of contractual provisions they put in amongst themselves. And all of the cases um, that I think you're going to be taken to, the Pacific Associates, the Toner case, are cases, as you will see, um, where people are trying to establish an assumption of responsibility which flies in the face of um, other contractual um, relationships that they have with each other. And so once again, I find myself saying, it doesn't matter. This big contractual structure which goes behind Sonora for the purposes of my claim about the negligence of those agents um, doesn't matter. It's, it's that simple. And I, the point that I make in the supplemental uh, skeleton, uh, <laughs> the invisible supplemental skeleton. You're, no, you're allowed to say that, um, I, I won't get away with saying I've already read that. Just to, to, so you can take me take you in as much detail as you wish. Yes. Um, I mean, the, the short point that I make there is this, that if you effectively decide that because of the contractual structure, in particular because of that clause 8 1c, which says um, effectively releases the defendant from any potential tortious liability to the claimant. If you say that the existence of that clause um, means that it's not fair, just, and reasonable to impose a duty of care, what you're effectively doing is enforcing that clause. Because you're saying um, that's there, it's inconsistent with the existence of that clause to recognise a duty, therefore there isn't a duty. To which my answer is, well, hang on a second, I'm not a party to that contract, I didn't sign up to that clause. You can't effectively enforce it against me by merely saying it's something which is inconsistent with the application of a duty of care. I mean, that, that's really the heart of my complaint about... Um, the way the judge approached this clause 81C, which is he's effectively enforced it against us. Now, I all I hear um, you're not really that interested in the, you know, the first part of our appeal, which was... I didn't mean to say that. I, I was, insofar as it overlaps with the central point, it's yes, obviously yeah. important. I, I see yes, that. Yes, all right. Well, we, we will go to that then. But um, so that that's really the, the kind of doorway through for me. If... If recognising a duty of care is not appropriate because of this contractual structure, effectively what one is doing is enforcing the contractual structure against this claimant. And it's not the kind of case where, for example, a subby is being sued by somebody in a chain of building contractors, where they've all got JCT contracts which carefully interlock and they've all been drafted over dozens of years by people who take account of industry experience, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. It's just not that kind of case at all. My client just stands alone in front of the defendant. They're not locked in. I think I've said it in several different ways now. I, I see I've said it probably too many times. Yeah, right. So, point, I see it. Yeah, so that, that's why it is not at all um, you know, unarguable. My, my client does have a real prospect, actually, of succeeding on the facts of showing that because of the factual relationship, the delivery of actual services, um, and because they're delivered through... Going back, of course, to my 
Lord's point about who was delivering those services. Who was delivering those services, yes. And we'll come you back to that. Come to that if, even right. if not now. Point. If we go to the, on this point, to the flat lease of flat nine. So um, that's the one behind tab 13. And we go to page 197 of the um, fourth recital. Again, it would just help. Which, which point is this now going? So the obligation, the arguable obligation to provide services at all. So the, the um, Lord point about uh, what is the obligation on the defendant to provide services at all? Or are they just retaining somebody else to provide? So really, it's the question I just raised with you. Yes, yes, I'm trying, yes, trying yes. to ask the question. Yes, I see. Okay, thank you. I don't think it's really my point. I think it's Mr. Duckworth's point. Right. Um, point vocalised by you, um, but belonging to Mr. Duckworth. The, um, in the recitals, in the fourth recitals here, we have an explanation as to why it is that this lease exists at all. Um, because previously the position was that the landlord had direct relationships with um, the tenants. But then there's this inter interposition um, uh, at some point in the, in the history of the, uh, the management company. And to just so I can make sure I've understood this correctly, this is a management company of the conventional kind in these sorts of blocks of flats, which is effectively a non-profit making enterprise owned by the um, flat owners from time to time. I think it's a little more complex than that in that I believe, and Mr. Douglas will correct me, that some of the shares in the defendant company are owned by the freeholder. I see. But Have we got any evidence? I don't... So you're telling me on instructions? No, I think um, Mr. Duckworth is going to confirm this. Yes, that, that's correct. Yeah. I see, thank you. It's a, not a point in issue. And uh, the uh, tenants do um, become shareholders when the companies, the, you know, the, the, the tenants at this level, uh, become shareholders in the management company. But precisely how it works is as yet unknown. I mean, to us in this room, perhaps Mr. Duckworth. Yes. Because remember, all I have done so far is pleaded a particular as a claim. There's never been a defence. I mean, we're no, I understand that. I, 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 if it had been common ground or there were evidence about it, I would just help me get a feel for it. I'd seen that the tenants of the flats had shares. Yeah. And I assumed it was wholly owned by them, but you're telling me it's common ground otherwise, but we don't know the uh, exact shareholdings or how, uh, the, uh, uh, what the constitution of the company is. Well, that's fine. Okay. I, mean, I hope that for present purposes it, it doesn't, it shouldn't matter to the decision that needs to be made here. Um, but it may matter later on. Yes, I'm sorry. It was just because we were talking about the company. Um, uh, I just yeah. took that opportunity to ask. Uh, you you were taking you were on recital two. The four. Uh, actually, recital. Saying that the purpose was to interpose the company. Or it arose out of the interposition of the company. Yes, and you've got the recital saying the lessor, uh, so that is the, um, the company that owns the freehold, has agreed to grant to the company 
a concurrent lease of the building uh, for a term of 75 years yeah. uh, to enable the company to discharge responsibility for the maintenance and management of the building and yeah. the provision of services. See? So um, certainly it appears from the recital at least that the provision of services uh, was something uh, which it was the responsibility of the company um, to discharge. And that, that clearly makes sense. Um, the, the fact that the company discharges those services by retaining an agent, a managing agent, um, doesn't mean that um, those services, um, there's no obligation to provide them at all. No, but for the purpose of tort law, the conventional analysis would be that if the services were provided uh, by the, the actual service provider as an independent contractor, yeah. the uh, person who was instructing them to provide the services, their contractual counterparty, would not be liable for uh, torts committed by them. Uh, no, that's absolutely right. And so, and but isn't that really the heart of what this is about? Um, I think in in this court, if this is. I mean, before, of course, below, this is not what we were arguing about at all. We were talking about the. I mean, the whole argument was about the impact of those clauses in the, in the in the lease. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, I. I'm contending um, that uh, it is arguable that the defendant was obliged to provide um, the services as set out in the amended particulars of claim. Yeah, yes, but just not to be picky with you, but so we know where we are, that's not really your problem. They were obliged to provide some services as part of the contractual structure. Um, to the uh, tenants, tenants um, or to the lessee. But as you've been at pains to point out, you're not really relying on that contractual chain. You're saying, as a matter of fact, they provided services to all residents. Mm -hmm. And uh, the factual background to them doing so was an obligation under the leases to, do, to, to provide management services. But since you're relying on a duty of care in tort, surely the governing principles are those that govern the principles of uh, the liability of agent of, uh, of principals for uh, the tort committed by their agents. And central to that analysis, or there, there may be some in the case law, but central to that analysis is whether or not they were independent contractors. If you're focusing on that question, it doesn't really help you to say they were under an obligation to see that these services or to provide these services as a matter of contract. The question is whether the tort was committed by the actual service providers um, as, uh, as independent contractors or not. Uh, uh, if I if 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 I'm not on that analysis right, please do say. But yeah. I'm just well, no, they, they focusing you on what seems to me to be the difficulty. Yeah. So it might be useful to look at Boasted here, actually. Um, yes. If you would take up uh, so that is well, it's tab sixteen. It's bound to be in the second uh, bundle. Hang on one second. So sorry, yes. going to look first at 8176. And which page are we on? 1011. Yes, I mean, 
Yes. Yes, and, and the point here is that, um, well, let, let's start with um, the, um, the middle of the page, uh, so the middle of the first paragraph, uh, there's a sentence beginning, a very rough summary of the usual view would be, I to say that people are liable for torts committed by another which they specifically instigate or authorise uh, or committed by their servants within the course of employment or involve breach of a non-delegable duty. Fine. The courier's liability in the law of tort has a different basis from agency and contract and elsewhere. In contract, the agent isn't liable as a matter of course. Um, finally, actually, we need to go to the next bit. However, the law of agency appears to be important in the operation of some torts, especially those involving liability for statements, including deceit, negligent misstatement, and more doubtfully defamation. It may also be relevant to tortious claims for negligent performance of services, where, as with negligent misstatement, the underlying explanation is, arguably anyway, the near contractual one of assumption of responsibility. Now, th this is the point um, yes. that we keep making here, that if the fair brother is the agent of the defendant, and if the defendant has, by providing services, I mean, I appreciate that this could become somewhat circular, and so it's going to involve dispute of fact, but by providing services, the defendant has assumed responsibility to us, and that creates the duty of care, stains and Troman, then the fact that the defendant directed its minions to provide these services is neither here nor there. It is the defendant which provided them. Um, and there's, if we go forward... So to the, mere, the, mere, the mere fact of provision is enough to create an assumption of responsibility. Yeah, if we go... Um, Can I just say, yep. for structural reasons, the, the, the way Bausted is arranged here, um, at the page you, you, you start with, page 1011, mm -hmm. internal 552, is the whole section on wrongs committed by um, agents towards third parties, and the introductory note, which is helpful. And, um, but it is only an introductory note. We then have, in the usual busted way, the the article summarising where they say the law is, which is at ten fourteen, and then commentary on that article section by section, uh, which you have not given us most of, just given us the first page. Um, there is quite an elaborate discussion which I've had a look at um, of. Um, particularly chapter, or I forget what Basti calls them, para two of that article. Um, article 90, you're on here. Yes. I, mean, I hadn't got that yet. Rule, wasn't rule two. Yes, all right, but we, we, we haven't actually got... Oh, I I see, yes, we, you skipped a bit, and then you've got that at rule 2C. Yeah. Yes, I see, thank you, that's very helpful. Yeah, sorry, um, uh, carry on. That's fine, Lord. The... Um... I'm here to help. The, as you say, rule to see on page 1015, where we were going next, is, is the point. Um, because I mean, I'm not suggesting that this is easy. I'm not suggesting that this was without controversy. Um, but on the other hand, I'm not making an application for summary judgment on the existence of the duty of care contended for. I'm simply saying that there is a real possibility that if we get all this pleaded out, get all the facts together, then it may very well be that the contentions I'm sketching out to you in this court turn out 
um, when covered in with facts, uh, to, to have real traction. Now, um, it is, I'm sorry. Are you waiting for me? Or? Uh, no, I, no, well, I was just you're, noticing you're, that um, there was uh, people were busy, and so I was like, wait for <laughs> no, you to, uh, to finish making any notes that you wanted yeah. to make. Now, the assumption of responsibility for providing services can be done by simply providing the services. I mean, that's not in the slightest bit controversial. Um, so, um, I think it would be helpful to look at. Um, Rush point at this point, uh, which you will find uh, tab 14. Uh, the report starts on page 938 of your bundle. It will be your second bundle. Uh, which tab? Is um, uh, tab fourteen of yep, the, probably the second you. authority bundle. Page um, and the, the section I want to take you to is is on page nine four eight. identified a distinction between categories of cases where um, uh, people could um, come under a duty to take reasonable steps to keep property secure. Um, and inside that category, um, the court identified a difference between situations where, I'm reading from paragraph 31, uh, the defendant is carrying out some activity in the course of which he's failed to keep the property secure or cases where he's done nothing at all. Now, our case is clearly not the second category. Um, what I say is that the defendant was indeed carrying out an activity by those porters providing their services. Um, and so we're into that, that uh, first category. Um, and there's the example given of uh, Stainsbury and Troman, which is a well-known uh, case. Um, and the point I draw to your attention is, is, is this. Um, Lord Justice Tucker's uh, citation from Lord Justice Tucker's quotation at paragraph 33 uh, makes it clear that um, they were looking at a contractual relationship. But he went on, I think that contractual, I think that contractual relationship did impose a duty on the plaintiff decorator to take reasonable care with regard to the state of the premises if it left him. During the performance of his work, that I think was the measure of his duty. And at paragraph 34 of this judgment, uh, Lord Justice uh, Coulson um, refers uh, to some commentary on Stainsby from Lord Mackay and Lord Goff in Smith and Littlewood. So, paragraph 34 of the report in Rushbond is citing Lord Mackay in Smith and Littlewoods, saying this, there was in that case, Stainsby, no special relationship between the decorator and the thief. Although there was a contract between the decorator and the plaintiff, I should have thought that on the same facts, a guest of the plaintiffs who had left property in the house, if it had been stolen, might also have succeeded in recovering damages in respect of that theft from the decorator. That case is proceeded on the basis that the decorator was liable because it was as a direct result of his negligence that the thief entered by the front door. I think it could be said that the purpose of the security arrangements at the door of the house 
was to prevent unlawful intrusion, and that a reasonable man in the decorator's position would have secured the door, and that on analysis his reasons for doing so would have been to prevent the consequence which he ought reasonably to have foreseen of unauthorised intrusion. And similarly, Lord Goff um, said this, there are that there are special circumstances in which a defender may be held responsible in all for injuries suffered by a pursuer through a third party's deliberate wrongdoing is not in doubt. For example, a duty of care may arise from a relationship between the parties which gives rise to an imposition or assumption of responsibility upon or by the defendant, as in Stainsby and Troban, where such responsibility was held to arise from a contract. And then let's take facts. And then over the page, um, such responsibility might well be held to exist in other cases where there is no contract. As, for example, where a person left alone in a house has entered as a licensee of the occupier. Now, my would certainly rely... Sorry, I'll let you make your point first. That's all right, my lord. You, you, you get but you would certainly rely on those passages to establish that the porters or the employers of the porters uh, with whom your client had no contractual relationship nevertheless owed uh, her a duty of care. quite understand that. Um, but that, that does that help on whether they owed an obligation to uh, the person who uh, instructed the porters and their employers to provide the services? but didn't provide them themselves. Well, the way um, I am putting it is the person providing the services was the defendant by the agency of the people that put on the ground. So it's saying, you do this, you do what I tell you, and you don't delegate it to anybody else, it says to Fair Brother. Supply these services, do it. That's what I want you to do. And then, those people on the ground are nothing other than sub-agents. And therefore, the things which they do wrong are the responsibility of their principal, the person who I am suing, the defendant. Now, it, at this point, I would make the complaint that it is a bit difficult dealing with this discussion in the absence of many facts. So, um, I mean, th these pleadings in this case could go through a number of iterations, I suspect, uh, in which, for example, the defendant says, well, you know, it was clear from signs on the door that responsibility belonged here. Though. I mean, I don't think that is what happened because they don't say it in any of their documents. But we don't have the full factual picture here. We have my client's experience, which is what gives rise to the assertions made. So these questions regarding um, the precise nature, I mean, whether, for example, those men on the ground, and they were all men, I think, those men on the ground, the porters, um, were independent contractors or not. I mean, the, the the contracts, the contract with Fairbrother, um, makes it pretty, makes it clear, the defendant's contract with Fairbrother, that Fairbrother is being directed to do these services and is not permitted to delegate them. being directed to do these services qua agent of the counterparty to that contract. And show us that provision. Yes, so let's have a look at that. <clears throat> so it's uh, behind tab 16 in the in the second bundle. 
You mean supplemental one? I do. The supplemental one. Sorry. Yes. So if my lords have so that. Which tab do you say? Uh, behind tab 16, starting at page 255. Yeah. And in the definitions section, at page 258. We have a definition of management services. The services to be performed by the agent as described both in this agreement and in Schedule 2 to this agreement. And then we go to page 261, clause 3. The company appoints the agent uh, to be its agent for the management of the property during the term, and the agent accepts such appointment and agrees to perform the management services in each case in accordance with the provisions of this agreement and the schedules to it. Subject always to the terms of this agreement, the company authorises the agent to act for it in its name and on its behalf in the performance of the management services during the term. On the face of it, it appears to be the defendant saying, I appoint you to do these things on my behalf, for me. I am doing them. I'm paying you to do it, but I'm responsible. That's why you are going to be speaking in my name. Yes. Well, I, I think that, that, that is the um, uh, point that Lord, my Lord, Lord Eugene, um picked up from Mr. Duckworth, which I was um, about the, the obligation of that, and that's what I point to. Now, um, I need to address. Uh, uh, could we just see, I don't know, if, if only for completeness, what it says about quarterly services in Schedule 2? Yes, of course. Page 272. So if we go to Schedule 2 at 271. The management services. This is, all yes, correct. But the relevant ones are, unless you want to draw us to any steps or any others, PSB 10 and 11, don't they? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I know that. Um, um, hang on. So it says to engage on behalf of the company. Well, my lord, uh, before you get too far stuck into page 272. Um, You're going to say those were changed? Yes, yes, I know they were, but I was just taking it okay, step fine. by step. Fine, fine. Okay, fine. Um, and uh, then those were, uh, and then to liaison, and 11, to, I think 11 wasn't, was it? Mm -mm. No. Um, and then, as you say, 10 was changed at page 281. Yes. 
but not in a way which has any impact on I, yes. Is it and the portrait says, staff were thereafter engaged, not in fact by Mrs. Fairbrothers, but by their companies. Yes. Or by they were at the day staff by the company. But then, as I say, I mean that's a, that was the way in which Fairbrother was permitted to supply the services under the agency agreement. Um, so still, you have um, the agency agreement, and still you have. Fairbrother acting as agent for the defendants at all material times. Um, an oddity, so, so sorry, just before, uh, no, no, uh, an oddity about the supplemental agreements is appears that, which I hadn't appreciated till I read this, that in fact the porters prior to the supplemental agreement were uh, owned by the free, were employed by the freeholder. Mm. Have I got that wrong? Do right by, by the respondents under the original provisions. If they were employed on behalf of the respondent, and under the new arrangements, they're in, they cease to be the employees of the respondent. Yes. Well, I, may, I must have misunderstood. Um, but just so you can show me why I've misunderstood, if you go to page two seven five, and I'm sorry if I'm distracting everyone, but I'm between the feet. See, the parties are the owner, which is Sun Life, the freeholder. The company means. Obviously, what it means, the agent means what it means. Um, and the uh, yeah. Yeah. operative provisions provide unscheduled one, there's a new clause, clause one, with effect from 2000, the employment of the transferring employees specified in schedule two to this agreement shall be transferred by the owner, owner to the agent, not the GP. Yeah. You look at Schedule 2, it names five porters. Now, I don't particularly know where this goes. It probably may not go anywhere, but one just does want to feel one understands what the contractual framework was. And therefore, with some hesitation, um, because you all know these papers much better than I do, I wonder whether Mr Duckworth is right to say that they were employed previously by the defendant. Um, this can be dealt with in so far as necessary later, but uh, since we were on this document, I just thought I'd draw that to your attention. Yes. In any event, we know what the position is after 2000, which is what matters. Yes, well, I mean, December 2019 is where, where we are really concerned about. And by that point, they are... Um, the actual employment contracts of these men are with two other companies. Fair brothers entities, do we call them? Exactly, but they're permitted um, by the, the agent, Fair Brother, is permitted to provide its services in that way. It doesn't alter the fact that everything Fair Brother does, it does as the appointed agent for the defendant, which we see from the Fair Brother contract for 3.2. that mean that, forget the matter, it's in the, under statutory employment law, that in law, the, in, as a matter of common law, the defendant was the contractual employer of the undisclosed, the undisclosed true employer of the porters after 2000, 
Gosh, my lord, I, I mean, I doubt that, but I'm not... Um, no, quite. I'm just wondering how, how, far the, how far the statement that everything they do is done on behalf of the uh, defendant goes. Well, I, my instinctive reaction is it certainly doesn't go as far as, as to no, make the defendant unlikely, the it? employer. Yeah. The, the analysis which um, I believe I submit is correct is that there are services to be provided under the Fair Brother Agreement, Managing Agency Agreement, and in providing those services, Fair Brother acts as agent for the defendant. But Fair Brother is permitted to provide those services in a number of ways, one of which is to outsource bits of them. But the, the fundamental point is when Fair Brother acts, it acts on behalf of the defendant. Thank you. My Lord, I've, my Lord, I have addressed um, the complex contractual structure duty of care point. I've addressed the how is it that I say this defendant was in a relationship with my client at all. I now need to address possibly quite quickly uh, this Hobgood, Hobgood and Brown Point, yes. which my lord indicated um, may not um, be causing uh, this court too much trouble. Yeah, but you're right, you still have to deal with it. Yeah. My lord, the, the, um, the point here um, is what the judge made of Hopgood and Brown, and in particular, um, one observation in it. So, may I take you to Hopgood? you will find tab two of the first authorities bundle at page five. Tab five. Uh, tab two, page tab five. Two. Sorry, so sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, so this is a case, uh, one of these post-war cases about bungalow building and disputes over the, um, the land on which the bungalows were built. Um, and um, if I may, I'll summarise. I would invite the court to read the, the head note in its own time. But the, the position was as follows. Um, there were building plots that were sold in 1932. One was the northern plot and one was the southern plot. And the words of the conveyance described the plots but the little plan attached to the conveyance did not really attempt accurately to state where the line between North Plot and South Plot ran. At some point, um, uh, the plots came into possession, one of a company, which was owned by a father and son, and the second, Southern Plot, came into the ownership of the son, so he was a director of that company. Uh, and he said to his father, um, to the company, uh, I wish to build on South Plot. Um, this is where I want to build. Uh, can we agree that where I build this um, is actually the boundary line? 
So it was a, a sort of a reassurance about whether the boundary line, uh, because there was uncertainty about the boundary line. And in due course, um, uh, part of the sun's building on the south of Wales, um, it turns out, as a matter of fact, encroached in a sort of wedge shape a few feet into North Plot. Now, the conveyancing documentation did not reflect that which had been agreed between North Plot and South Plot. So when North Plot came to, to sell to the plaintiff in this case, Mr. Hopkins, what the conveyance said was exactly the same as it did in 1932, with the uncertainty appearing on the plan as before. And Mr. Hopgood complained in due course because when he built his own bungalow, he found that he couldn't actually get his car in because South Plot's bungalow in f went into, he said, or in fact did go into North Plot by a few feet. So he sued and he said, look, the contractual documentation shows that the land that was conveyed to me was such and such a shape. What you have built encroaches on my shape. You need to tear it down or you give me damages for it. Um, and what the case concerned, um, because the county court judge had raised the point with the uh, defendant, was a stop off. Was it the case that because the company owner of North Plot had reached an agreement with the son owner of South Plot, yes, you may build there, and yes, I will recognize that as the boundary, um, that the successors in title to the company um, were stopped from contending on anything other, other than that which the company had agreed. Um, now, the, the part which um, um, the judge below in this case um, referred to um, is, uh, starts on page 16 of your bundle. Um, it says page 224 of the report uh, in the judgment of uh, Master of the Rolls. Um, the only other question is whether the disability on the company's part from averring the boundary to be in any place other than that where they, with the defendant, had put it, is equally binding on the plaintiff. Uh, so this is what case is about how do we get um, an estoppel that would be raised against the company? Is it relevant at all to the company's successor in title? In my judgment, uh, that can also be answered in favour of the defendant. Uh, and I accept the passage read from uh, Chief Justice Mansfield's judgment in Taylor and Needham, which was a case of estoppel between lessor and lessee, but the principle is the same. So Chief Justice Mansfield said, then the question comes whether the assignee... Let's read this to ourselves. Of course, my dear. Yes. Now, um, the words used there um, by the Chief Justice are um, refer to the title of the lessor um, when the lessee under whom he derives, and it's this word derives, uh, which has given rise in the instant case uh, to the judge's conclusion, because our the judge below here um, considered um, that, um, and it, we need to look actually at, at his judgment, pa paragraph uh, 67 of his uh, judgment, which you will find in your core bundle at page 
page 88. Judge found that having considered Hopgood and Brown, privies to privies to the contract, which is to say the flat lease, 1984 lease, which contains clause eight, with the release from liability of the defendant. The judge found that the privies to that contract will include not merely the parties to it, but anyone who derives title from the representor, and that the claimant is therefore one of Sonora's privies. So the proposition of law um, which the judge articulates there is that um, if a um, tenant under a lease grants a sublease, therefore that subtenant is a privy to the tenant's own uh, lease arrangements with the, the head landlord or in this case, the intermediate landlord. And uh, in my submission, the uh, difficulty with this proposition uh, is that, as is clear from Hopgood uh, and Brown itself, um, and Taylor and Needham from which that citation is drawn in Hopgood, what Chief Justice Mansfield was talking about uh, and, and Master of the Rolls are talking about was a situation where an, an entire contract had been assigned. And of course, there's a very big difference between a man assigning all of his rights and alienating them from himself forever into the hands of another, and a man maintaining all of his rights under a contract, and then carving out from that some inferior collection of rights, which he then exploits with a third party. And it, in my submission, it cannot be the law. Um, that a subtenant in the position of the claimant in this case is a privy to um, any other contract, the contract by which her landlord has the title from which he carves out her interest. It is a, a very straightforward point, uh, this one. Um, and I have now read briefly through your replacement submissions, and that's part of what you were saying there. Yes, it is. Could, could I just, it may not be directly on point, but while it's, could I just ask for your submissions about the relevance of clause 10 of the assured shorthold tenancy? What, what do you say that means? That's at page 250 of the supplemental one. Yes, of course, my lord. She has clearly assumed some obligation in relation to the um, superior lease. Uh, well, my lord, um, if I may say, we need to choose our words very carefully here. So I accept that what she has done is said, I will conduct myself in such a way as in, is entirely consistent with the obligations which you have accepted under the superior lease. And there's an obvious reason for that, which is if she is free to behave in a way which takes no account of those obligations, her landlord will find himself in difficulty as a result of the position under the superior lease. So he has obliged her, you will behave in the way that I must behave. And she says, yes, I accept. Um, that I will perform and observe your covenants. I mean, the, the language here is slightly loose because obviously she's not actually performing and observing his covenants, but she's behaving in precisely the same way so that her actions do not put him, or sorry, Sonora, in breach of those covenants. Well, an obvious 
this example, you get lots of things about when hat washing out of the window or whatever it might be. Yeah. She is saying, isn't she, I will not hang it here. I see that in the head lease somewhere there's yeah. an obligation or a prohibition on hanging washing out of the window or an obligation not to hang washing out of the window and I promise not to do so myself. But what she doesn't say uh, and cannot realistically be read as having said is um, I also, um, even though I'm not a party to the contract and I haven't spoken to your landlord, I also, like you, um, forgive your landlord from all liability in relation, or in relation to negligence. I state um, that um, any porter doing any act does so at my agent. She doesn't say any of those things. Um, and cannot be read to have done so. So do you, do you say that the provisions in the head lease which apportion liability for negligence as between the parties to the head lease, that they're not tenants' covenants? Yeah. Yes, I absolutely do. Therefore outside yeah. clause 10 altogether? Yes, they're not contained in clauses which say this is what there's a covenant. They're, they're expressly said to be agreements between those parties. So follow um, and this is where this whole point, which I think has, has, has fallen away as a result of Mr. Duckworth's um, very sensible agreement with me about this. I mean, these cover this is not a covenant that runs with the land. I mean, this is just nothing of the sort. Clause 8. I mean, it's just a contractual agreement between those parties to that lease. Um, and if the defendants are going to get anywhere on this, is they have to show that somehow or other, my client has become bound by it. Um, and as I say, the... Hopgood and Brown point is does not help in that regard, no matter how well the learned judge said. Um, and indeed, I urge you to find that that is wrong. Um, well, the, the final point that I uh, will make is that the last part of the judge's judgment, um, which is at um, page 89 of your core bundle. First, in paragraph 67, um, the judge said, my client was a privy, we dealt with that. Um, he, in 68, says that there wasn't a common law duty of care, because that would undercut the contractual scheme, and I've dealt with that. But he also said, at 69, further or alternatively, um, he finds it necessary that the relationship between claimants and defendants is not sufficiently uh, close, um, not one of proximity such that it would be fair, just and reasonable. Um, and on this one, um, I mean, this, this is very, the, the judge here several times drew attention to the fact that it's theoretically possible, he believed, for my client to sue other people. I mean, it was theoretically possible that she could have taken out insurance. Um, and he was surprised at the absence of insurance. Um, sorry, am I, am I being slow? Where, where does it say about the insurance? Well, the insurance, I'm sorry, that comes a bit earlier. I was, uh, that's a bit of a background um, point. Um, let me tell you about the insurance. Yes, I do. Well, uh, if it's important, you'll better show it. I, have, I hadn't um, spotted that. But... It's a slightly different point from the point about there being a cause of action against Fairbrother. Yeah. So paragraph 21 is where he talks about all the other ways in which the... Uh, 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 may, I, may I just have a look at that? Because yeah, I, I hadn't attached importance to that when I was reading. It wouldn't really make much difference if she no. had been insured because the insurer would have been subrogated to whatever comes right. from that. But precisely, but the, yes. the judge was, as you can see from paragraph 69, the 
judge considered it wouldn't be fair, just, and reasonable for a number of reasons, one of which is this contractual structure point. Um, um, but he also says, as part of his reasoning, I note that the claim is not being brought against Fair Brother. It's not being brought against the porters, their actual employer. It can't, it's, not, it's not being brought against others. From which I had understood, and I submit, it was part of the judge's reasoning, there are other ways home for this woman. Why does she need to go down this route You know, when there are other ways? And he criticizes her for not having the insurance. He criticizes her for not seeing other people. And my point here is that... It doesn't matter. Is it a criticism that she didn't have insurance, or is it just a noting that she's not insured? Uh, well, my lord, um, perhaps the fairest way to put it um, is that the judge noted with surprise the absence of insurance. Well, most people do have contents insurance, but yeah. not everybody does, and sometimes they're, they're not sufficient, and sometimes premiums aren't paid, and so on and so forth. I mean, it, it, I mean the difficulty, my lord, is that if one expresses oneself in a judgment about something, then it's fair enough to consider that it must be relevant. And as my lord correctly pointed out, insurance is totally irrelevant, totally, because any claim would, you know, that it should, the insurance would be subrogated to this claim now. And um, um, what I invite the court to do when looking at the proximity question, I mean, I've set it out in that um, first skeleton of ours in support of the application for permission. But actually, when you consider the proximity question, um, if I'm right that the defendant provided these services, we don't need to get into proximity at all because we're in the assumption of responsibility chain of analysis leading to economic loss. So it doesn't really arise, although of course it's a useful cross check um, to apply the Caparo factors. But they are in a proximate relationship, or certainly arguably in a proximate relationship, um, because of the provision of the... Isn't one of the, one of the questions you take into account in deciding whether they're in a proximate relationship? Uh, whether obligations of a similar nature are owed to them by other people. Um, it may not be decisive, but it's yes. relevant. Y yes. Well, but of course, in this particular case, what I say is that in providing the services, they assumed responsibility, and it's the, the action of providing. And then, we, of course, we just don't need to look many further. To well, that may or may not be right. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure assumption of responsibility is the key to everything. But... But it's, uh, we needn't debate that point at the moment. I, no. I thought what you were about to say, or were saying, was that it was irrelevant for the judge to consider, as he apparently did, that they were owed a duty of care by Fairbrother. Yes. And or the Fairbrother companies and or the individual porters. But let's just say Fairbrother. Um, why is that irrelevant? I agree it's not decisive, but why is it irrelevant? I, I think we'll find in the authorities recognition of the um, fact in deciding what's fair, just, and reasonable if you're really going to apply Caparo factors, the availability of other, and it might be said more obvious people to sue, um, uh, is a relevant consideration. Why not that? Or to put it the other way round, uh, the one reason for finding a duty of care is there's otherwise nobody who can yes, remedy a so-called gap. Yes, um, well, as I say, uh, I hope it's not controversial, the proposition that once one has got an assumption of responsibility, the question of fair, just and reasonable has been answered already because the assumption of responsibility is down. But even deciding whether there's an assumption of responsibility, you may have to decide that it's fair, just and reasonable to treat someone as having assumed responsibility. They haven't. Ah, well, well there isn't here an there isn't here an obvious obligation. There isn't here an obvious explicit assumption of um, uh, responsibility for by uh, the management company to your client with whom they have no dealings uh, to see that the uh, or to perform the services carefully. By providing the services, those porters 
if I am right that they are the sub-agents of the defendant. By providing the services, they are assuming responsibility. Well, that's what you say, um, but uh, isn't that a little bit... Uh, have you any authority that puts it as... I'll start with that. Let me... Uh, uh, well, give me... Is your case as simple as this? If I'd employed deporters directly, then I would be providing porterage services to you. If I choose to provide those services, I have to do so carefully. I didn't in fact employ the porters, but the arrangements we've seen are such that I'm in the same position. They're still my porterage services being provided by Fair Brothers Associated Companies Limited. I'm providing portrait services, so I, if I choose to do that, I have to do it carefully. That's is, is that that's it? That's it. Yeah. That treats. If I'm going to provide a service to you, then I'm assuming a responsibility to do it with yeah. due care. And if we go to Henderson, um, please. So back to Henderson Merritt in your authorities bundle, page one three eight. Um, of the bundle itself. Just give me one moment, sorry. Can you give me the internal page reference to the... 178, my lord. Thank you. Yes. So, my Lord, um, the section of the judgment titled The Governing Principle, where Lord Dolph says that you can take this fairly shortly. Um, by reference to Edley Byrne. Sorry, I um, have gone to the wrong page. Uh, 138 in the, inter the bundle. Reference. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, and starting at um, letter D, so having introduced Headley Byrne, um, Lord Gough observes that the case has always been regarded as important in that it established that in certain circumstances a duty of care may exist in respect of words as well as deeds. Um, and here I'm talking about deeds, you see, porters providing services, deeds. Um, and uh, the quote, the citation, um, um, from Lord Morris between F and G. I would invite you to read. That's at Um, referred very early in your submissions to a case which I recently made a judgment called Benyatov. I thought that was merely an elegant courtesy to me, okay. saying I've been in this area. But there is actually something in there about these very questions, isn't there? I, I yes. can't now remember yeah. exactly what I said. I think in broad terms, uh, it was something of an assumption of responsibility sceptic. Um, yeah. But I can't remember exactly what I said or in what, how the analysis went. Well, my Lord, um, since um, you've reminded me of it, I will look at it over lunch. It may or may not be relevant, but perhaps um, well, the, you and Mr the, Duckworth should, just in case it is relevant. Yes, I, 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 I don't want to be unfair to Mr Duckworth I, I, at all. I think that the point I was trying to make about Benyatov was that that was a case that concerned a brand new type of duty this was the case yes i know it was a different context but i did nevertheless yeah you needed to look at um well what are the rules for discerning 
duties of care. So you go through. Yes, there is a, well, just so nobody's in yeah. for just for those who haven't don't have it at their fingertips, it was a completely different situation. It was in the context of an employment relationship, but it was about um, uh, whether the employer, a bank, had undertaken a responsibility, uh, contractual or tortious, to uh, protect his employees against the uh, risks of working in a foreign country, and particularly the risks of being unexpectedly prosecuted. prosecuted. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and, and... So I don't think... That the, the fact could not be more different. No. All I'm saying is that you've triggered a recollection that there is a discussion in that judgment of um, the role of assumption of responsibility and, and uh, the extent to which it may be relied on in relation to the provision of services as well as mere words. Yeah. Yes, I mean, there's plenty of law on this. There's a Bank of Scotland case last yeah. year as well, but in the Supreme Court. But, but if I may put this in rather kind of humble terms... If I say to somebody, let me do that, I'll do that for you, that is me volunteering, assuming a responsibility to do that thing. Once I have said, I'll do that. And uh, I mean, what, the thing is now, most of the time when we're looking at Headley Burn, it's because we're dealing with some complicated new proposition about economic loss arising from statements. I mean, that, there's so much recent law on this, it's just an endless a mind that keeps throwing up cases but the starting point for all of these cases is it was a development from acts and deeds yes and we are back in in this case in the world of acts but the and question deeds. is fairbrothers said that fairbrothers said we will provide portrait services here but fairbrother did not speak save as the authorized you i authorize you to speak but is that name. relevant in my submission, yes, it is very. You say it's determinative of the specific this sub issue. Yes, yeah. I mean, not of the whole case, obviously. But can I ask you another point, which Mr. Duckworth takes? Bailment. Judge said, "Porters may have been bailees." He seems to have been un unsure about that. But let's assume the porters were bailees. But he said the porters were not your the defendant's agents. Therefore, the defendant's not liable for the bailment. And permission to appeal on that has been refused. Mr. Duckworth, as I understand it, says that establishes that the porters weren't the defendant's agents. And it can't be any different for the question of who's providing the porterage services can't be a different answer to that than it is to who received the keys. Yeah, well... Um... Again, if you draw a deal with an implied, deal with an implied, but I, well, it I was a point I, that, that I noticed in Mr. Yes. Duckworth. Yes. So, I think Lord Justice Popperwell didn't give permission on that point. If you turn to page 93 in your core bundle behind tab 8. You mean didn't refuse permission on that point? Um, you know, he did ref he refused permission on the bailment point. Right. Um, and um, the way he did it was to say at page 93 um, that uh, the fact that for the purposes of the defendant fulfilling its obligation under the head lease, the porters were the defendant's subcontractors and were acting for those purposes that, as the defendant's subagents cannot impose a liability in bailment. Now, we haven't actually yet got to the point of deciding whether these porters were, as I contend, subagents. As I um, understood Lord Justice Popperwell's grounds of refusal here, he was saying bailment is um, a personal, um, the creation of a personal relationship, and it's quite difficult because of the nature of bailment itself 
to pass responsibility for a Bailey's failures up the chain. Now, I mean, if I had been, obviously, it would be useful if we could uh, be arguing this point on, on appeal, because it may not necessarily, with all due respect, be right. But, but for present purposes, just because somebody is not an agent for the purposes of bailment doesn't mean that that person can't be an agent of the defendant for the purposes of doing those very things, this provision of services. I um, cannot argue against the fact that the ground of appeal for bailment was, was not permitted, um, but I can take that point. Now, my lords have um, bowled to me already in advance um, quite a few of Mr. Duckworth's um, points. Um, but to the extent um, that he, I mean, he's now he will make them all himself, uh, and to the extent that um, I need to reply to any of these points of law, I will, of course, do so. But unless I can assist you further with the grounds, the, the argument in support of the grounds of appeal, that is the appellant's case. Not as far as no, any of us are concerned. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Mitchell. It's been very helpful. Yes, Mr. Duckworth. Um, my Lord, before I get going in earnest, can I tidy up uh, one or two loose ends that were left over from the discussion that took place during uh, my and friend's submissions? Uh, the first is... Uh, my Lord Lord Justice Nugent's question about whether the service charges in the sublease is reserved as rent uh, and uh, checked since that discussion. The answer is no, it wasn't reserved as rent. Does that not mean that the claimant was liable under her AST to pay the service charge? Um, I think that probably is the, no doubt, unintended consequence of the um, way in which the obligation is framed in the sub underlease. You say probably unintended. Do you, I mean, I, do you have any basis for saying that? It may be. Well, the, one would ordinarily you... expect there to be. A, I mean, it is sometimes the case that sub tenants are required to pay the service charges, and then one has mechanics for the tenant to serve the demand, and then there are provisions as to whether the sub tenant pays up to their landlord, who pays up to their landlord, or whether they pay directly. So normally, one would expect to see um, okay. provisions that set all of that out and and it looks and it's a um, fairly chunky rent that the appellant was paying it looks as though it was a it's it, a very fashionable bit of london isn't it, it is, yeah um my lord the next point that came up in the course of my friend's submissions is um it is my learned friend right to say that the respondent was obligated as a matter of the contractual scheme that sits above the appellant to provide porterage services, or services generally, but I think he's specifically looking at porterage. Um, he didn't take you to the key provisions, but for, uh, your lordships may have already spotted this, but in the supplemental bundle at uh, page 215, provision is made for the uh, respondent in the performance of the covenants on its part, uh, an absolute discretion to employ going over the page on such terms and conditions as the lessor shall think fit, one or more caretakers, porters, porters maintenance staff, uh, or such other persons may from time to time in its absolute discretion consider necessary. Yes, sorry, I, I, I know that. I haven't bothered to pick it up. What, what, what clause is it? It's clause, uh, it, it's, I was reading from uh, clause 8i. It's 8i, yes. Yes, okay. and, and your Lordship is quite right that there is uh, also 7i. Yeah. I'll talk to you. Oh, sorry, I was reading. is 7i. Yes, I beg your pardon. 7i is what we've just been through. Uh, 8i. Sorry, I am now turning you up rather belatedly. Yeah. 
which starts on 220. Let's all may from time to time, and it's absolute discretion, withhold or add to the services. So again, that's that's the ability to add or detract from the services. And then 8K is also important because one question is, are they obliged to provide... Stop with, I'm being very slow. What instrument is this? This is this is the flat original flat lease. This is these are the terms of Sonora's sublease. Uh, and we are looking in the 1984 sublease because those are the provisions that are incorporated by reference in yes, this. It's rather confusing calling it a sub why, yes. why, why is it a sub It's the lease. Uh, the, only the interposition of the current lease arguably makes it a sub lease. I'm not sure it does. It's not a sub lease. Well, I, I suppose what I'm intending to convey by that is if, if one looks at the chain of title, you have the freeholder at the top. Uh, you then have the what I call the head lease, which is granted to the respondent. Uh, and you then have the uh, sub lease. The, what are called the flat leases. Your Milan friend yeah. calls them. Well, no, they're called in the, in the documents. They're called the flat leases. Yes. yes. They're not sub leases because they're not granted out of a head lease. They were granted first before the concurrent lease was granted, I believe. That's not quite right, actually. Not quite right? No. no. So the sequence of events is head lease, original head lease 1992. Replacement head lease 1998. Yes. Original flat lease, what I've called the sub lease, uh, 1984. Uh, replacement 1999. So that by the time Sonora's see, current yes. lease came into existence, concurrent le lease. What is called the concurrent lease? I, I don't call it the current lease. I, I, what I call the head lease was already in place. It had become a head lease by then. Yes. It yes. was already in place, and uh, all three. The freeholder and my client join in. Well, well, the truth is, one can argue about what is more convenient to call it, but it does. It doesn't really feel like a head lease, um, uh, sublease situation, because effectively this is a management company. Yes, that's right. But it's in the in the form that one quite often encounters, where the. Uh, freeholder who doesn't want to have day-to-day -day contact with the occupants of the building um, incorporates a management company, grants a head lease to the management company, and yep. then the subleases are granted from well, that. Anyway, we, we so, now see why you call it that, and we see what the arguments are both ways. Anyway, with that, sorry, but getting back to where we unless my lord... Has... I was just going to say, I'll distract you, but the, the, the point is, what we are looking at in this document is the obligations that Sonora undertook in the replacement flat lease. The obligations that the respondent undertook in Sonora's 1999 granted flat lease. And the 1999 flat lease, which starts on page 182, uh, does very little more than, as Milena Friend has already pointed out on page 188, incorporate... Yeah. the provisions of yeah. the 84 lease, which, which is why uh, I focus my fire on the terms that one finds in what was the 84 lease, but which transported so incorporating those the word mutatis mutandis is quite important because lessor doesn't mean lessor. It means what it, what it is. It means, the, it means the company. Yes, but but I am. The respondent is the lessor to Sonora. So it's not, it's not so defined. No, it isn't so defined. It's rather inelegantly phrased. But the, the, yeah. the fact that the, what I call head lease was already in existence means that of necessity, in order to grant I, a yeah. new got, lease we, with well, vacant with the right to immediate possession, it's got to be me. We've got that. Uh, my lord, I, I was and, and so, Clause 7 is the lessor's covenants, i.e. That's me. Your covenants. Um, so my covenants... And, and, and 8, Clause 8... Is a is is a is a series of provisos, yes. Um, so, which the, to some extent create, or obviously to some extent create, freestanding rights and obligations. Yes. So we looked at seven one. That's yeah. a discretion to provide quarters. Eight one is a discretion to add or or withdraw 
services. And the other one that's important is 8K at the bottom of the page, uh, halfway down the page at 221. Because one question is, is it a necessary for the, is it an obligation of the respondents to provide porters? Another question is, is it an obligation to provide porters who do things for the flat tenants, the Sonoras of this world? And what 8K says is that no caretakers, porters, uh, maintenance staff or other persons employed by the lessor shall be under any obligation to furnish yeah. attendance or make available their services to the lessee. I mean, to, yes. I, I just wanted to tidy up, my lord. It's but can, can we just spell out? As I stumbled over this, but conceptually, and there may be all sorts of grey areas on the ground. What conventionally a porter in a mansion block does will, to some extent, be things it's doing for the lessor, um, ignore the complications of who the lessor is, um, basically to ensure uh, either because the lessor has promised to do them, like taking away the rubbish, uh, uh, or changing the light bulbs and the common parts, even though those may benefit, will benefit the residents, they're basically obligations which the lessor has got to do. So a porter and a provision of security also. And that's in the lessor's interest and the resident's interest because they want the building burnt down or trashed by people coming in. But then there are services which are really only peculiar to the residents, like um, collecting their Amazon deliveries. Um, uh, and you would say key holding. Um, and that's the distinction, that's the kind of distinction that Kay is referring to when he talks about uh, to furnish attendance or make avail uh, available uh, services to the lessee. Yes. You sometimes also get porters helping you with moving in and, yes. you know, taking a delivery of a, of a sofa or something. They'll yes. carry it up. And All that sort of stuff. The draftsman of this lease has well in mind, plainly, um, the possibility that porters may do things for the tenants yeah. as opposed to the more general... And he's things. making a distinction about that. Yes. Um, There's a whole question which obviously you'll be coming to about whether uh, Mr Mitchell would say, so what, my client wasn't party to any of this. But um, in any event, it's useful to see exactly what it yes. was. In terms of what the what respondent had to do, it wasn't obliged to provide porters, and it wasn't obliged to provide porters who do things for the tenant. Nevertheless, it was empowered to do so, and if it did so, it could recover its costs under the service charge provision. And what do you say about the fact that the porters in question are referred to as being employed by the lessor? So at the time when, uh, the, Headley, when the flat lease was granted, that literally meant employed by Sun Life. And as we've seen, that appears to have continued to be the case. Something you're about to tell us. Yes. Um, even if for less or you read now uh, the management company, uh, is it relevant that they're referred to as being employed by the lesser or the management company? Well, it is relevant in this sense that it, it what was originally contemplated, the structure that is in place within the 1984 sublease, is one that contemplated. Um, Sun Life, freeholder and landlord, um, appoints fair brother to me the managing agent. Um, fair brother would then employ uh, individuals, including porters, and they would do so in, in the name of the landlord. So the landlord was going to be the employer of the porters under the original scheme. And then when we, ha when we have in place the current structure, the respondent as the landlord for the purposes, doing all of the things that the landlord does for the purposes of what I call the subleases, uh, was in the original scheme, contractual scheme, going to be the employer of the porters because although Fair Brothers was required to go out and get them, uh, it was doing so per paragraph 10 of the second yeah. schedule in the name of uh, the respondents and therefore the respondent yeah. would be the employer. And, and that's why one has a lot of a lot of the references to 
that we've just looked at are to the porters, management staff employed by the lessor. Yes. So I think perhaps this point you about to come to the point that I raised with you is technically correct. And that's why they needed to be transferred under TUPI. They looked as though they were, in, if you looked at their employment contracts, they'd say you're employed by Sun Life. That's obviously what happened in fact. Once one has the respondent imposed in between the freeholder and the sonoras of this world, what one would have expected in order to marry up with the contractual scheme that the porters would have been employed by Fairbrother on behalf of the respondent, who is the company under the management agreement to which Schedule 2... I don't know what on behalf of means in that context. If you looked at, under that scheme, if you looked at the porter's employment contract, who would be identified as the employer? Well, what, what you would have expected to find, I agree your lordship has it right that there is a slight anomaly in terms of what actually was the position as at the date of the supplemental management agreement in 2000. But if you look at the original Schedule 2 at page 272, paragraph 10, the services that Fairbrother was contracted to provide uh, were to engage on behalf of the company. The company there is the respondent, um, porters and staff and all the rest of it. Now, by the time we get to the supplemental management agreement, there is the slight anomaly that, as your lordship has identified from part one, schedule one, the respondent wasn't the employer of the porters at that stage. It was uh, the owner, which is defined uh, as being Sun Life. And therefore, the tupying across that one finds at paragraph 1277 yeah. uh, is owner to Fairbrother rather than, as one might have expected, respondent to Fairbrother. Yeah. But then what one does see, and my own friend took you to this, and he's, he says this is entirely vanilla, but I say it's potentially of import for reasons that I will come to, but as we're doing the contractual provisions now, let's look at paragraph 10 on page 281. Whereas paragraph 10 used to say that Fairbrother was to employ porters on behalf of, in the name of, the respondent company, the new position is that it is to do so in its own name, so that Fairbrother is to be the employer and to do the employing, and it does so uh, not, not acting as, in effect, the respondent. Yeah. So to that extent, when, when employing the porters from and after 2000, Fairbrother is not the agent of respondent, the respondent, it is not effectively the respondent standing in its shoes, it's doing so in its own right. Yeah. Uh, the only other thing to show you in this context is the paragraph 10, which I don't think Melona Friend took you to, of the original management agreement, which survives, which is on page 265. In the execution of the management services, the agent shall deal with third parties as the agent of the company for purposes expressly authorised by this agreement, but shall not otherwise represent itself as the agent of the company, nor pledge credit for the company in any other way. So in other words, in doing the management services, those things that Fairbrother is supposed to do on behalf of, in the name of the respondent, it, it is the agent, but not otherwise. And as we now see, when it comes to the exercise of employing porters, the relevant services in Schedule 2 specifically require that to be done by Fairbrother acting as principal, principal and employer. Well, 
My lords, th those were just the tidying up exercises yes, thank you. that I wanted to undertake before I um, got going in earnest. Uh, what I would like to do is to um, structure my submissions uh, in four parts. Firstly, to deal with the main event, which is Grand 3, uh, was the judge's conclusion that there is no arguable basis for imposing a duty of care, right or wrong. Next, I want to deal with Grands 1 and 2 together, and relatively shortly, and I want to look at whether the judge did commit either of the errors that he's accused of having committed, namely, one, concluding per grand one, that HC and K are directly enforceable against the appellant, and two, whether he made an error about how the estoppel by deed point works. But then I need to address you on whether if he did make either form of error, what the implications are for his overall conclusion that there is no arguable basis for imposing a duty of care uh, on the facts alleged. So that part two. Part three is my respondent's notice, uh, in which I say that if the judge was wrong in concluding that there's simply no duty of care at all, his decision should be upheld on the alternative ground uh, that the respondent's duty, if, if it had one, was a duty to take care in that which it does itself. Namely, the, in, in the case of the respondent, the appointment of a managing agent, suitably qualified managing agent, the breach of which duty is not alleged in the amended particulars of claim? Appointment or appointment and supervision? Um, my Lord, I think I would probably go as far as appointment and supervision. But, but again, you say that's not what's, what's alleged. Yes. Um, either, I, it could be either, but I can, I can live with the broader appointment and supervision. And, and when and that is, I don't want to get into it now, but when the law, my Lord says, putting it very simply, your case is that you're in this contractual system uh, and you have to take care. Take care in what? I, I say, for reasons which I will develop in a moment, that the way in which the uh, law of tort works is that the respondent at its end of the contractual chain needs to take care in what it does, what lies in its control, and that is the appointment of suitable, a suitable managing agent. I mean, there's a considerable overlap between that and your first point. There is. Yes. There is. And for what it's worth, even if it were right, and it's not right for the reasons that we've just looked at, that Fairbrother in employing porters was effectively the respondent, because the respondent as principal stands in his shoes, Fairbrother's duty, the most that one, one could expect Fairbrother to do, would be to uh, appoint, as it did, uh, a suitable contractor to provide the services, because, of course, that friend tends to overlook the links in the chain are freeholder, respondent, Fairbrother the managing agent, FSL or APSL, which are the contractors which, uh, under an arrangement with Fairbrother, agreed to provide the uh, porters, and they did employ the porters, including the porter who gave away the key. Which I see that you may be analytically strictly correct, but it might not be a difficult hurdle for him effectively to treat Fairbrother including Fairbrother entities as a single group, but that wouldn't worry. Well, ab absolutely not, my lord, for reasons why we come to in a moment. One, one must absolutely, not. You absolutely don't agree with I me. absolutely don't agree with that for right. reasons that I will come okay, to in, in a moment. But the way it is wrong to conflate 
the different entities simply because an assumption of an assumption that they are in some way connected in terms of working out where liability lies in the law of tort. Um, it, it is, of course, not known whether they are connected. Well, Fairbrother, the name rather suggests that FSL is a group company of some sort of Fairbrother. Um, uh, the uh, Abbott company, one doesn't know. There was, there was a bit, but it's slightly inconclusive in the witness statements about this. Yes. Uh, it doesn't tell us uh, one so way or another. I don't want to waste too much time on this, because I think if your case really depended on this point, you might be in difficulty. We just don't know enough. But just suppose that FSL, ignore the Knight Porter people, FSL was a pure employing company, just for matters of internal company administration, um, uh, it employed the it employed the people who would otherwise be employees of Fair Brothers. Then, all the obligation, all the things done by the employees were things they were told to do by Fair Brothers. Even, That's the kind of situation I had in mind where it might be that, uh, for the purpose of a duty of care in tort, you wouldn't want to make a distinction between Fair Brothers and FSL, depending on the facts. I will come to that, my lord, but let me... You're let saying, even a, so, look at the contractual chain. It, it, there is a, a crucial difference in the... As, there is a crucial difference between there being a contractual relationship between the two parties and one of them acting as the agent. So, in effect... Yeah. And, what, and I'm, going to, I'm allowing myself to be blown off course here, but let, let Sorry, me make I, clear... I, I'm um, you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let me make clear that if there if there were if the pleaded case was and indeed it were established that in taking custody of the key the porters were my agents the respondent's agent because fairbrother cloaked sorry i cloaked fairbrother in authority to do things in my name Fairbrother cloaked FSL in the same authority, it delegated its authority to do things in the respondent's name, uh, and Fairbrother uh, passed on the same ability to the individual porters. You then have a, an unbroken chain of agency, so that, it, that in those circumstances it would be right that everything the porters does, everything the porter does is in law something that I, the respondent, have done myself. If you don't have a chain of agency and you merely have a chain of contractual relationships, the law of tort doesn't work in that way. That is not how uh, the uh, common law principles that we're applying um, operate. But, my lord, let me... I was sketching out the direction of travel. Yes, yeah, so what was I your fourth one? Yeah. Um, I, I may or may not need to deal with this point because my learned friend, I'm not sure, really dealt with it at all. But his ground five is that the judge should have declined to enter the arena and simply uh, pass it all off to the trial judge. I don't think it's fair to Mr. Bitt. He didn't deal with it under the label ground five, but from time to time in his submissions, he said, look, the facts are just haven't, proper facts haven't been found here. So yes. I think. I still need to deal with it. it. Whether you need to deal with it very lengthily is not a matter. But. Well, I'm going to focus most of my fire on ground three, but perhaps I might, your lordships, I'm quite content to carry on if your lordships would like to do so, but it is a convenient moment. It is a convenient moment. Uh, two o'clock. All rise.